Megan. Are we live now, Megan? See, I blame Kevin Couric. We got talking about Hamilton, the musical. And I could talk about that all day. I also blame myself because you know me and my, my microphone batteries. I always forget that. Well, welcome to worship today. Uh, last week, we had Ted Davis's funeral, and it was absolutely beautiful. If you want to, you can get online and see that on our Facebook page or on our YouTube page. I also want to let you know, it'll be in the paper today, that Steve Stroll also passed away last week. Yeah. So uh, they'll have visitation on August 8th at Burton Funeral Home. So you'll get all of that information in the Erie paper, and we'll make sure to put it out on our Facebook page as well. Are there any other announcements for today? Yeah, Ms. Carol. Oh. oh, what's her brother's name? Dick. Okay, I'll put him in the um, in the prayers for today. All right. Wonderful. Are there any other announcements today? All right. Well, as always, if you have any other prayer requests, just let me know. Otherwise, you can always put them in the comment section on the Facebook page as well. All right. Well, let's calm our hearts and minds and prepare ourselves for worship with a moment of silence. We are invited to sit or kneel for the confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please pray with me our confessional prayer, which you'll find on the screen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. We are invited to take a moment to silently confess our sins. We are invited to stand for the assurance of forgiveness. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by God's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, 
let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Please join me in our gathering prayer. Holy God, as we journey through your holy scripture, open our hearts and minds to your word. Send your Holy Spirit to help us hear what we need to hear and learn what we need to learn. In Jesus, amen. We are invited to be seated as Will sings our gathering hymn. Our children's chat today is brought to us by the Jones family, and the first reading is brought to us by Cindy DeHannock. Well, hello, friends. Thank you, Ansel and Jude and Xavier and Sebastian, for helping me out today with the children's chat. You're welcome. Thanks. This week, we're going to talk about Leah and Rachel. So I want to tell you a story. So there, there was this man named Jacob, and he fell in love with this girl named Rachel. So he went to Rachel's dad and said, I want to marry your daughter. And the dad said, okay, and set it all up. Do you see a problem with this story? Yes. What's the problem? Uh, they didn't ask Rachel. Right? They didn't ask Rachel what she wanted. So then the dad wanted to marry off his older sister, Leah, first. And so you know how brides wear veils? Mm -hmm. Well, he put Leah in the veil and had Leah marry Jacob instead of Rachel. Do you see a problem here? They didn't yes. ask Leah. They didn't ask Leah. So poor Leah gets married to this man that she doesn't really even know. And then Jacob says, well, can I marry Rachel too? And the dad said, yes. And so one of the things that really is difficult about this story is that neither Rachel nor Leah had any choice in marrying Jacob. How angry do you guys get when somebody tells you what to do and you don't have a say in it? A lot. A lot. Yeah. I would be pretty mad too. So it's important that we get to say our opinions, right? But it's also important for people to listen and for us to listen. Because maybe if Jacob and uh, Rachel and Leah's dad, Laban, would have talked and said, hey, maybe we should ask those girls, and then listened, I mean, maybe Leah didn't want to marry Jacob. So I think it's also, don't you think it's important that parents and grandmas and grandpas and kids have to use their voices and talk about things and then each listen so that a compromise can be made? Yes. Yeah, I agree. But is it always easy to do? No. Do you guys ever get really angry and yell and scream? 
Yes. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I do too. So will you guys pray with me today? Dear God, please help other people to listen to us and our opinions. And give us the patience to listen to other people and their opinions. So when we have conflict, we can find a compromise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let us now hear the word of the Lord through our Holy Scripture. Our first reading is from the 8th chapter of Romans. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is with us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is, who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to Thanks God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Genesis 29, 15 through 28. And this is what I'll be preaching on today. So we don't have the Alleluia and we don't stand because it's not a gospel reading. It's a Hebrew scriptures reading. Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, you should therefore serve me for nothing. Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her away to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. In the evening, he took his daughter, Leah, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid, Zilpah, to his daughter, Leah, to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you with, did I not serve with you for Rachel? When then have you deceived me? Laban said, this is, not, this is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. 
Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last week, we heard the story of Esau and Jacob, where Jacob dressed up like Esau in order to steal from his blind father a blessing. Well, this week, it seems like the story has flipped. Now, Laban, the father of Rachel, has dressed up his eldest daughter, Leah, to look like Rachel. She's the bride. And so when uh, Jacob finally is able to see her face, he notices that he has been deceived, much like he deceived his own father. But like I said last week, God is able to expand the blessing, the blessing that God had given Abraham for many descendants and then given to those descendants a great land. So God is able to expand that blessing, not only for Jacob, who is the father of the Israelites, but also to Esau, who's the father of the Edomites. So God is able to expand, which we oftentimes have a tendency to keep God small. And so God expands God's blessing again this week. We have poor Leah, who's just kind of thrown in the mix. And we have Rachel, who's the one that was supposed to get married. So even in, in, in the midst of all this deception, God is able to expand God's blessing to all the wives of Jacob. So let's look at the family tree of Jacob. So you have Leah and Rachel. When Leah married Jacob, her servant girl, uh, Zilpah just happened to be thrown into the mix. So she becomes a wife of Jacob as well. And then when Jacob marries Rachel, Bilhah is thrown into the marriage. And so he, she becomes a wife as well. Now, all of the blue names that have numbers above them are the 12 sons of Jacob. And they become the 12 tribes of Israel. So what happens is God gives them land. And so if you're from the land of Levi, you become a Levite. If you're from the land of Benjamin, you become a Benjaminite. So we see Leah had six kids, seven including Dinah, who's a woman. But she had six, she had half of the tribe's of Israel. Rachel had two sons, Joseph, who's Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat if we want to talk musicals again, and we'll learn more about him in a couple of weeks, and then also Benjamin, and from the line of Benjamin comes King Saul. From the line of Levi with Leah, we know that God has blessed her a lot. She is blessed with being a descendant of Moses and Aaron and other great priests of the temple. And we also see from the line of Judah comes King David, King Solomon, other kings of Judah, and eventually comes God's son, Jesus Christ. So God's blessing has not only expanded to Esau and Jacob, but also expands to Leah, Rachel, Zilpah, and Bilhah, and all of their sons. So God's blessing is so much bigger than we can ever imagine. But I wonder, what would have happened if Leah and Rachel were able to have a voice in the decision about their marriage? Throughout their marriage to Jacob, Leah and Rachel are constantly fighting to gain the attention of Jacob. There is all this animosity, and as we'll see when we start learning about Joseph, there's also animosity between the sons of these women. 
Because of all of this deceit, because of all of this frustration and anger that they're feeling, it trickles down into their family tree. And as we know today in the world, when we don't have voice, when we aren't given a voice, we get frustrated and angry. We see on the news one side yelling, trying to be heard. Because like we said in the children's chat, it's about speaking, but it's also about listening. So they, they raise their voices, trying to get their opinion across. But then we also have the other side that's not listening, but is raising their voice, trying to get their point across. And this voice raising, trying to hear their opinion. And we have all of these voices screaming at each other, trying to hear, to, trying to get the other sides to listen. But nobody does. And so the next thing we know, there's violence and animosity and anger and frustration and the breaking of relationships. So what would it have looked like if Leah and Rachel were given a voice? It takes courage to let people have voices. What if Leah would have said, yeah, I'm not doing it? We wouldn't have six of the 12 tribes of Israel. Or what if Rachel said, no, I don't want my sister to get married to my husband. No it would have changed the plan that Laban and Jacob had. So it takes courage to let someone speak and give their opinion. And what's interesting in this story of Leah and Rachel not having voice is that Jacob's mother had voice in her marriage. Rachel, or Rebecca, was married to Isaac. So Abraham, the father of Isaac, said to his servant, go and find my son a wife. So the servant went back to Haran and found Rebekah. And so went to Rebekah's dad and her brother Laban, the same Laban we're talking about with Leah and Rachel, and said, hey, I think Rebekah would be good for my uh, master Isaac. Is that okay with you? And the father and Laban said, yeah, sure. So then they went to Rebecca, and uh, Laban's mom, Rebecca's mom, said, let's, let's give her 10 days here at home. I'm not ready to let her go. So Rebecca's mom and Laban, again, the same Laban, goes to the servant and said, can Rebecca stay an extra 10 days? We're not ready to give her up. And the servant said, no, she's got to go and meet her new husband. No way. And so... Laban said, let's get her opinion. Let's ask Rebecca and see what she wants to do. So Rebecca said, no, I'm going to go. It's time for me to go and meet my husband. So Rebecca, Jacob's mother, had a say, had a voice in her marriage. But Laban didn't do the same thing for his two daughters. Maybe because he was afraid of what they would actually say. Like we said, it takes courage to let someone have a voice. It takes courage then to listen to that voice, to try and understand what that voice is saying, why they're saying it. But being able to have, they're called courageous conversations. Being able to have those courageous conversations that make us uncomfortable are important. It takes courage to speak what we want to speak, and it takes courage to listen to someone that we might not agree with, that might have a different idea. So how do we work on these courageous conversation muscles? Because let's be honest, it doesn't come naturally. We've all had to have those courageous conversations, and they're not fun. So how do we work on these skills? Will we find a community that we're comfortable with and that we trust and we start to have these conversations? So one organization that I'm a part of is this group that meets every other Thursday online and we talk about racism in the United States. I know, right? The minute I say racism, we're all like, oh, yes, I know. 
It takes courageous conversations to be able to have that talk about what is racism and how is it affecting our country. So what we did is we decided to have guidelines. So uh, uh, communication guidelines. So we can have courageous conversations that build bridges instead of tearing them down. And we used um, this, this uh, method by Eric Law. And it's on our Facebook page um, because it's, uh, our group really likes this way of communicating. So all of these stand for respect. So the R in respect is responsibility for what you say and feel and speak. So it's responsibility for the words we choose. The E is for empathetic listening, not just words, but also feelings being expressed, nonverbal language, including silence. The S is for sensitive to the differences in communication styles. P is for ponder on what you hear and feel before you speak. That one is hard. E is examine. Examine your own assumptions and perceptions. C is keep confidentiality. And T is trust. Trust the process because we are not here to debate who is right and who is wrong, but to experience true dialogue. So these courageous conversations, the goal is to learn and to understand. It's not to figure out who's right and who's wrong and point fingers. That's what courageous conversations are all about. It's to try and build bridges, to understand each other, because we all have opinions. We all want to be able to speak what we think is right. But the counter narrative, the other side, is also impo important to know because everyone has a grain of truth in what they say. So it's important to be able to be in relationship with each other, especially in a world like today that's being ripped apart and also in this year, which is an election year. There's a lot of opinions out there. So maybe if we have courageous conversations where there's trust, where there's compassion, we can learn from one another. We might have to agree to disagree, but we still stay in relationship. And yeah, we've known in my racism group, there are things we say that are going to be offensive. There are things we say that are going to hurt, and we ask for forgiveness and apologies, trying to work on those courageous conversation muscles. Because much like this story, what would have happened if Leah and Rachel could have had a courageous conversation? Maybe there wouldn't be so much conflict in that family. Maybe there wouldn't be so much conflict in the world today because of one conversation in our history. I don't know. But maybe if we would start working on our courageous conversation muscles, we'd be able to build more bridges. We would be able to have more relationships where we learn to agree to disagree, yet still love one another. So let's this week work on our courageous conversation muscles. Amen.
are invited to stand for our public belief statement. Let us confess before God and one another our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are invited to sit or kneel for the prayers. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Loving God, you have given us the gift of powerful words that can build bridges or destroy relationships. Help us to use words to teach and understand and once we're done speaking, remind us to show respect and humility and listen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our nation's leaders. Increase their desire for justice and equality. We pray for our enemies. Bridge the chasms that divide us and guide authorities to a deep and lasting peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your spirit helps us in our weakness. Send your spirit when we do not know how to pray. Give comfort to the dying, refuge to the weary, justice to those who are oppressed, and healing to the sick, especially Linda and Paul Conrad, Sean Conrad, Marcia Grace, Pat Kernick, Charles Roward, Jan Sperlin, Jared Bliley, Richard McGarvey, the family of Ted Davis, who died this week, the Collins family, whose dog Molly died this week, the Stroll family for the death of Steve Stroll, Jake Douglas, who was in the hospital last week but is now at home and doing fine, and friends of St. Paul's, Natalie, Kelly, Linda, Jack, Kathy, Bob, Robert, Jim, and those we name now aloud and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You show steadfast love and direct us to ask of you what we need. Help this congregation ask boldly for what is most needed. 
Refresh us with new dreams of being your people in this place and time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray over the offering given today through the mail or electronically. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. We are invited to stand for our communion dialogue. As we're standing, I just want to let you know how to work these things. Uh, this white piece is your bread. So we take the cellophane, the clear plastic off first, and then we peel the rest off, and underneath is your grape juice. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to God, who through this holy meal gives us courage to be able to have difficult conversations and build bridges instead of tearing down relationships. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise, their, we praise God's name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We are invited to eat the bread. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We're invited to take our drink of our cup. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive the blessing. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are invited to be seated as Will sings our sending hymn.
Go in peace, Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. I heard it. 